In our quest to improve the quality of life of people with prader willi syndrome, there's no time to stop. No breaks, no rest. We recognize the robust research and progress already achieved through the powerful alliance of patients, parents, families, physicians, and researchers. At Seleno, our goal is to address the challenge of PWS and to develop a safe and effective treatment. And we can't get there without you. As a parent of a child with PWS, I've learned that I need to use my voice to help advocate for my daughter. We are the voice for our children. To the patients with PWS and your families and friends who struggle to live a full life with this rare condition, we hear you, we see you, and we support you. Your passion, energy, and commitment inspire us daily in our quest to improve the quality of life of people with PWS. Your resilience fuels our determination to develop a treatment that could truly change lives. We're making a difference together. Welcome everyone to our virtual 2021 PWS Family Conference presented by Salino Therapeutics. Before we begin today's session, let's first thank our amazing sponsors, Salino Therapeutics, Levo Therapeutics, Harmony Biosciences, Radius Health, Inversago Pharma, Sandiona, Consonance Therapeutics, and Nova Nordisk. Their support allowed us to make this conference free for all of our community members, and we are incredibly grateful for their contributions. Janice Agarwal is a pediatric physical therapist with over 30 years experience, including coordination of the neurodevelopmental evaluation team of Boston City Hospital and the early intervention team at St. Mary's Hospital for Children in New York. Janice lectures and publishes nationally and internationally on neurodevelopmental intervention sensory integration, and the hypotonia spectrum, including prader willi syndrome. One of Janice's areas of expertise is using sensory integration to normalize acquisition of developmental milestones and to manage behavioral issues in adults and children with special needs. Hi, my name is Janice Agarwal. I'm a pediatric physical therapist. Uh, I live in Zionsville, Indiana. Um, I've actually been working with pediatrics for about 35 years, the last 20 years or so, a lot with kids with prader willi syndrome. So, and like she said, my area of expertise is really the sensory integration because with every movement that you make, you have to be able to feel it. You have to have that connection with the brain. So one of the things I've given you is to start out is a sensory page. Every set that we go over, I would want to make certain that you just tick off one thing that you can do when we finish this lecture. So sometimes as we go through these lectures, it gets a little overwhelming and you're like, I want to do that, that, that. But you'll notice I've given you little, little areas and I want you just to pick one thing from vestibular, one thing from proprioception, just one thing from each. And that way you'll start to see the change. This sheet of paper will make it a lot easier for you um, as opposed to going through a book that I wrote, but there is a book that you guys can have. I have a child with Prader-Willi syndrome. Alex is now 22 years old. Um, so we were diagnosed at eight days of age. So we were very, very blessed. I had seen many kids with Prader-Willi syndrome prior to my son and I wasn't such a great diagnosis, but um, we, uh, several of us were the ones that put together that package of hope because I believe that if we work with our children really well, they are delightful. They're delightful kids. They are the most awesome. They can do all the things a lot of the other kids can do, but it's gonna take a little bit of work. So we're gonna talk about creating a sensory diet for your kids. And we'll just, and that's kind of the missing link. So I don't know how many, how old our children are. I think we were gonna ask, what is the average age of the participants in this lecture? Is there, do we, did we get a number on that? Um, I believe I'm speaking with a very young, what is the age of your child with Prader-Willi syndrome, please? Okay, if you could let me know. So that way we can kind of, we can make this a little bit easier for you guys to see. 
Hey, Janice, do you see the poll? I saw it, but it doesn't okay, give great. me numbers. Okay, right now it looks like 41% are, uh, their children are ages zero to six months, 21% seven months to one year, 41% one to two years old. So this is oh, a zero to two. The best audience ever. Okay, so you guys, this is my area. I was an infant specialist. So you have my heart, you have my heart. And I believe that the optimal time to work to get your children better is now. This is the time, these are the ages, you are the people, this is who I want. You guys are, this is the time we have the most ability to normalize a lot of the movements and the things our kids can do. So let's just go through this and have some fun um, knowing that information. So what is sensory integration? Now, I know a lot of you are receiving therapy services and I personally am a physical therapist, but every time your child moves, they not only move, but they have to feel the movement. So this is what I wanna encourage you to do is with all your therapists, I want you to start talking to them about how to integrate the sensory part because they need to feel what their movement. So the interesting thing about our children, babies, um, infants with, hypo um, mobility is they're not getting all the input they need. It actually starts in utero. So we have to kind of create that environment for them and give them that ability to move. So that's really, it puts the, the thing on you, but we can make that fun and we can make it easier. So what it is, it's just taking all the sensory information around us in, organizing it in our brain and then using it. So an example of that is being able to touch things. You're feeling your hands move, your fingers move, plus along with whatever you're touching, that textures. That's how we start to learn. That's how we start to process information. So we have to start including the two of them. So our, the brains on our children are, are quite normal. And the, the sensory and motor stuff is actually normal. It's just the communication is having some issues. So we're going to kind of try to bring that communication gap together. So all children with Prader-Willi syndrome, every single one has a sensory processing disorder. Oftentimes at this age, I hear people say, well, they said my child doesn't have any sensory issues. It is because they're not moving or they're not moving a lot that we're not seeing adverse issues. So just know that they do have it and we want that to be a positive thing. So things that we see is an acute awareness of background noises. They may be fascinated with little things. Um, they have, as they get older, they'll have some coordination issues. Um, and, and that's something we wanna kind of challenge them now so that we don't see as many of these. And this is where we see though, with these um, sensory issues as a transition, a difficulty with transitions. So what we wanna do is we want to take the sensory integration, which will be foundational for their motor skills, their social skills. Think about this. When they're in a line and they're afraid that something's going to touch them because they're hypersensitive, um, they may kind of get, kind of get, uh, have a little bit of meltdown if someone accidentally touches them. We don't want that to happen. So we want to become more, more normalized. And the areas we're going to study are the vestibular, the proprioceptive, the tactile, the oral motor area. So I'm not used to this whole virtual stuff, which is a little wonky. So let's start with the vestibular issues. Um, the vestibular provides the movements of gravity and the change of head position. Vestibular starts in utero. So when you felt that baby do a triple sow cows, that was, they were starting to develop that information. It's all in the head. So what happens is um, you have this circular canal in the inside of your ear and it has all this little like cilia hair and that starts to tell you the position of your head. So they, as they're moving, they start to learn how to get, learn that balance, learn what gravity is by changing their head positions because naturally we want our heads to always be upright. You'll oftentimes see kids going side to side. If you move them side to side in their heads, always try to stay in that upright position. That is your vestibular. That's your inner ear. So without this, what we see are the 
a lot of the balance problems. We see kids who are fearful of moving. You know, this is the time when, when as a baby, we want to rock them as much as we can. Or you'll see moms who just naturally move their kids up and down. That's just working with a vestibular, which it can be very soothing. So the vestibular system is going to help us to properly see with your head writing. And if you want to keep your nice head nice and upright, that allows our visual acuity to be in, in order. It helps us maintain our, pop, our posture. As our head is more upright, we'll get a more upright posture. So when our, our babies are a little slumped over and floppy, as we start to work on the vestibular system, it's an amazing thing. You will start to see them slowly become more upright. Later on, it's gonna help us maintain a balance. So we have a thing called protective reactions. Protective reactions are allowing our head to be safe. So when our children start to learn to sit up, they need to be able to toss their hands forward or to the side or backwards if they start to fall so that they protect their head. So that's gonna help us learn to protect ourselves and, and get those reactions so that later on in life when they're walking and they fall forward, they, they throw their hands out so that they don't hit their heads. That's a really important thing because we want our children to do all the normal activities that other kids do. And if they're fearful that they're gonna hit their heads when they fall, then they're gonna stop trying to move as much. Our writing reactions are the things I just told you. We, at three months on a normal child, we start learning writing reactions. So three months, we, we three to six months is the forward reactions. That's six to nine months of going side to side. And around 12 months is when we start protecting ourselves if we go backwards. Our children are delayed in this, but this is something that we can work on a lot to get them a lot, lot closer to a timeline. I'm going to say this once and I'm probably going to say it 50 times. I have a child with Prader Willi syndrome. I am a physical therapist. I understand that this can be a little overwhelming to, to think about some of these things, but these are really important things to be thinking about. So as we look through this, I want you to really go, okay, this is really important. My child is delayed and that's okay, but we want them to go through the natural processes so that they can become more normalized. There's a catch up mode, but that's a really important thing to remember that we, we have to do this in a very, very linear method so that they learn how to do one thing before the next. So we'll have a plan of action. Um, the other thing about vestibular though, I want you to realize is that when we do rocking or when you bounce your child, vestibular is the one thing that actually also helps us to calm down. So we'll use that to our advantage with our children. Later on, it's gonna help regulate behavior. So well, here's what we see with vestibular. We see an inability to use eyes and hands together. Now, why is that really important? So remember, it's head writing. And as we're head writing, we're using our hands. So this is gonna be important as we move into further skills as they grow up. So we want them to be able to use their hands while they're doing things. So as they're looking up, they'll be able to grab out for things. It's also part of the balance, paying attention, avoiding movements. If they're afraid, they're gonna avoid movement. Um, this also helps us learn to organize things. So the other thing that I think is a very important thing and the reason we need to learn this is a thing called auditory processing. And that is something I really want you to write down Many, many of our children have this issue. We believe that they're not listening to us, but sometimes because there's vestibular issues, because it's the inner ear and the canal, sometimes the environment around them becomes a little overwhelming. So while we're speaking to them, they may not be hearing us because the environment takes up too much of their attention. So as we work on this vestibular stuff, we will find a better ability to have attention. So that's something important, especially as they get older. Sometimes the teachers will say, I don't think he's paying attention to me. And you'll go, well, maybe we need to put him in the front of the class, or you can put a microphone on a teacher and put a pair of earbuds in a kid and they'll hear exactly, they won't get that distraction. But that is one of the things we start to see. And it starts to happen around three or four years of age. 
But we, as we have worked on more vestibular issues, we see those problems resolve. So I things you can do now, pick one of these. You can do a lot of rocking. I love just those chairs that rock and rock and rock. You can start spinning. One family came up with those sit and spins and they put like a lamb skin on it and they started the child learning to spin. Um, you can bounce them on balls and what that's gonna do is you're bouncing, you're gonna see their posture start to, to kind of straighten up as they're trying to get their head up. Remember, as the head becomes more upright, the body will start to follow behind it. So for most of you right now, I would say, right now, learn to rock this kid as much as you possibly can. Rocking all the time. When, when they're sitting, instead of sitting in a, a regular car seat, sit them in a rocking chair. Sit them in those little rockers, side to side, front and back. If you have time and you wanna play, put them in a towel with two of you. You can rock them back and forth or side to side. You can make it a lot of fun. Remember that whatever you do once, you may have to do a thousand times because they're gonna like it so much. If they don't like it, if they start to cry, then that means that we have a vestibular problem worse than you think. So you're going to have to just keep doing it. So what I recommend is when you're doing a little bit of rocking and they start to cry, pick them up and give them a little cuddle and say, it's okay. And give them a deep, deep, deep cuddle. So they, they, they feel it right to the bones and then say, we're only going to do this a few more times. I never want to lie to them, but I also don't want them to say, if I cry, you're going to stop this. We want them to continue to do this. This is really, really important. If you think about little kids that are in the normal spectrum, you see the babies are rolling and rolling to grab things all the time. You'll see little kids that love to sit and spin until they go crazy and they fall down and they get back up and do it again. Our bodies crave the vestibular attention. Our children don't do that. They, they tend to be, because of the hypotonia, they tend to not do as much. So you, you'll see that they will not do as much, but they actually want that. They desire that, they just can't do it. So we're creating an environment that allows them to do it. One of the things I really love to do is on the ground, when I'm wor working with a child, I'll grab their legs and I'll cross them over and let them go side to side. And you'll see that eventually they start loving you doing that. That's a fun thing to do. And again, once you start doing it once, they're gonna want you to do it a thousand times. And if you can do it a thousand times, do it. Again, vestibular also helps with the slow rocking when they're upset. That's one of the things that we use. And that's one of the things we're going to use even as they get older. So having a rocking chair around when, the, when our children get older is a really good thing just for them to relax. So proprioception. So we're done with vestibular. Now we're going to go to proprioception, kind of a wonky word. This is a system that gives you information about your position, how your, your limbs are moving and your balance from the other systems. Proprioception is in your joints. It's an ending in your joints that tells you where your arms are, where your head is. It's your, again, it's that networking going from the, the ability to move and the feeling of that movement comes right from our joints. So, Proprioceptive input means that we provide unconscious awareness. You're doing things and you don't, you're not even aware of it. Like I'm sitting here and I'm moving my hands and I don't realize I'm, that I don't, I don't pay attention to it. But our kids do because in order for them to move, they have to really think about it. It tells us our positions. If I move my hand way up here or down, my brain knows that my hand is up here because all the joints that I have are telling my brain what's going on. It's kind of a background noise. It communicates how much force is needed. So one of the things we have a problem with, with many of our younger children, is that when they, they squeeze things or when they touch things, they don't understand how to grade that movement. So as a young baby, let them hold a young baby chick, they will think they're, they're being very gentle, but they're kind of squeezing it the little life out of it. So this, those joints in that hand tell the brain how much uh, pressure is going on. And that's a really important thing as we think about how to move, how to write, how much pressure we use on a pen, how fast we should use our legs to go. We wanna keep increasing the input 
of those joints to the brain so that they can get higher level skills. So oftentimes, again, what we see are very clumsy kids. We see they exert too much or too little pressure. When they're holding a pencil, man, you can see the whites of them. They, they have tantrums, and they throw themselves on the ground. I mean, we see a lot of that and some of that's the input they need. Um, they love lots of deep hugs or they're seeking that, uh, that, that kind of boundaries because their body is unaware. So if they have touch, then they're like, they know exactly what's going on, but we want them to learn to be comfortable in their own skin. So some of the treatments, and this is a really important thing. I love weighted blankets. So I believe it's 1% per body weight or every 10 pounds, but to have a weighted blanket, I know there are a lot of moms out there that make these things, but um, when they're sleeping, they have no awareness when they wake up of where they are. So having a slight weighted blanket is a really nice thing for them to have because they feel their body. Um, I love tight clothes on them too. Um, as they get older, I love them to carry heavier things, pushing and pulling items, crawling through boxes, etc. But for this age, I would start with very tight clothes. So what do I mean by tight? So moms, think about this. At the end of the summer, after you've gone through the summer and say you're getting dressed up and you put on a pair of hose, you, you feel that initially. You're like, whoa, I can feel my hose. So we want that feeling for our children. So as they put on clothes that are a little bit tighter, the Bendix vest, um, I love girls uh, stockings, even for boys because they start to feel their, their bodies. I love t-shirts that are a little bit tighter. Um, girls bathing suits so they can feel their shoulders down to their crotch. They, it kind of gives them a little bit of pull, not so tight that it you know staves them off from, from circulation, but tight clothes. What happens is tight gloves and tight socks, you'll see them start to move their feet because they can feel their feet. Um, getting them in water. This is a great age to start them doing some water therapies. It's, it's a gravity lesson situation where they get to start moving and they'll start understanding what the movement means. So for proprioception, and that somehow didn't show up. So the treatments are, again, I want you to think about this. Um, for our proprioception, I would like you to to mark down that we're gonna look at tighter clothes and we're gonna start looking at some weighted items. Even if it's just a heavier blanket, I want you to think about using those with your child so that they can feel their bodies. The next section we're gonna go into the tactile. This is a pretty powerful area, okay? Because it is our whole skin and it gives us the feeling of our body and in our environment. Um, it's the area we often assess dysfunction the, the first and easiest, right? And so you'll talk to older parents and they're like, oh, he picks, he does this. We can resolve all of that at a very young age. The, your child doesn't have to go through all of that at all, okay? So tactile provides us with the information about light touch, pressure, vibration, temperature, and pain. These are all areas our children have problems with. So we can start working on these right now and resolve a lot of them. Okay, feedback from this system um, contributes to the development of our body awareness. As we feel things, we become aware of those things. Um, they also help with motor planning. So when we're talking about the tactile system, we're thinking of light touch and deep touch. So it has a, a it, it protects our kids, but it also gives them the awareness, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is talk to you about the warning, okay? That light touch. So when you touch a child lightly that has a problem with sensory issues, you are creating this horrible, horrible thing for them. It's uncomfortable. 
they will scream at you. So whenever you touch one of our children, I love when you go and you touch deeply, you touch deeply. So instead of touching the skin, I want you to touch the bone. So that when we grab their hands, okay? Because what we see when they have these issues is um, sometimes these kids have cuts and bruises and we don't even know what's going on. So if, if we're going to the bone, they're starting to feel that skin. We're gonna make, by going deep, we allow them to learn light touch. We know that a lot of kids, our kids have issues with minimal pain and temperature issues, but you will note that if they get a little scratch, they'll scream their heads off because that light touch freaks them out. Um, why do we need to work with this? We have to be really careful is that I see a lot of children that don't like to wear hats or gloves. They don't brush their teeth. They don't like their hair brushed because of that touch. So I love when you go in with those kids, like do deep again, in order to get rid of the light, you go deep. So I love to do massaging with these kids, massage their heads, massage their hands. You know, in public, we see a lot of these kids, they do this flickering of their hands or they bite their nails or they chew their lips. We don't want our children to look any different than anybody else's. This can be resolved now at this very young age. We don't want those. If you ever see that coming in, you stop them and you give them an alternative tool. You give them a squeeze ball or you go in and you massage their hands. We see kids picking at their skins. We don't want that. We go deep, we go in and we massage that area, stick a Band-Aid on it because we want them to be aware that we know what they're doing, but we can fix it. Um, they need extra space. As these kids get older, they'll be in line and they're so afraid that someone's gonna accidentally lightly touch them that we find it's easier to put them in the front or the rear of a, a line because they're scared to death of that hypersensitivity of the light touch. Again, we always tell people, make sure you go in deep. They're very sloppy eaters or dressers. This is truly the definition of frump. Um, we don't want that for our kids. We want them to be cute. We want our kids to be cute. So these are also the kids that can't have tags in their clothes, et cetera. So what do we do? We do brushing, rolling, and deep massage. So I, at this age, every single night when I, I would, well, it's like everybody loves Raymond or news or something. And I would put my child in front of me and I would start at their feet and I would start deep massaging. And I would start slowly working up every single night, massaging up the bones all the way up, including their head and their hands. Um, we found that we could take him anywhere and if he got a little upset or, or had a problem, we, he would just give us his hands or his feet and we would deeply massage that. And that was something that would help relax him, but it also gave him an awareness because he, he would become a little impulsive. Deep pressure. So one of the things I really love, and it makes it a little difficult on a screen to show you, but I love taking their joints and just putting pressure on their joints. Um, that, I mean, again, that proprioception that we spoke about before, you have all of these amazing uh, sensory issues in the joints. And if we put pressure on those joints, deep pressure, it gives you a better body awareness and it helps your body understand what pressure is all about. So it helps awareness and it helps the tactile element. It's like a two for one. As they're getting older, how do some of the things that we can do? So the most important thing you can do, write this down, is give these deep massages and massage your child, massage their head, massage their face, massage their, their nose, their teeth, so that we can become aware of it. For the young babies, they have the nook brushes or different brushes. In the beginning, massage their gums because that's giving awareness to their mouth. And it's also desensitizing all of that. Um, massage their ears, their head, their hands, their feet, their backs. I mean, everything you can do. Massage, massage, massage. I understand that we're families and sometimes we can't do it all the time, but I encourage it every day while you're watching something for a half an hour, just go in there. And it's a wonderful bonding time also because you get to talk to your child, but even if you're not, you're just massaging them and they're realizing that they have more body awareness. It's the greatest thing you can do and it's encouraged, do it 
as often as you can. As they get older, I love dress up boxes. So they, they put on the gloves, they put on the shoes and they can have fun. We want them to learn to, to take our clothes on and off, but we, but we wanna make it a fun thing too. Again, I can't begin to tell you the power of hand massages and foot massages. We can take our son anywhere and when he gets distracted, he just gives us his hand and, and we massage it and he relaxes and we can get through another half an hour to an hour of a concert or something. So that's a really important thing. I love messy painting, hand painting and stuff like that as they get older because they're constantly going and feeling different textures. You know, we, our kids are just naturally lover of pets. They, so they can learn to start brushing their pets, petting their pets. If you can't find sensory toys, you can make sensory toys. Right now with all the gloves going on, take a set of those gloves. You can put it, fill it with rice or flour or something and, and close it up and let them start learning to squeeze it. At the very young ages, we need to start bringing things to our mouth. Our mouth is the thing that teaches us not only the distance to get there, but allows that sensory to, so they can see it. The other thing it does is it allows that visual ability. So I know that if I pick this thing up, I, I can feel how far apart it is. And then when I bring it to our, my mouth, I start to learn the distances of different things. So we start working on our visual acuity and, and increasing the ability of our eyes to move things and move back and around and follow things. I love fidget toys. You know, you can go to pet stores and find the best inexpensive um, fidget toys ever. So, um, can't begin to stress enough getting all of this stuff for the tactile. The next thing we're going to go on because we're kind of on a schedule is oral motor. You know, we got a kid with crowder willie syndrome, so we're all kind of afraid of the oral motor. And yet it's the oral motor that teaches our children the most at this age. We know that a lot of our kids don't suck. They don't like to bring things up to their mouth. We have to encourage them to bring things up to their mouth. It's a really important thing. Again, it teaches us the visual. It teaches us the oral motor. It teaches us textures. It, and, it, and it allows that ability to learn. And that's a really important thing. So the oral motor is important because when you learn to suck, which our kids have a problem with many of them, that promotes your trunk flexion. When you suck, you go down. When you blow, you extend. So as they're blowing out, they're learning to get a little more extension. It also, the, all the jaw stuff that those are all muscles that we're using. Those have the proprioception in there. They have the tactile in there. So we're learning how to use those muscles. So oral motor is, I think the most important thing because it's a, you can use it for soothing. You can use it for arousing and our children need to learn to talk. They need to learn. They need to look, bring things to their mouth. So I love blowing bubbles. I love oh, la, 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 doing stuff to their mouth so that they learn to make noises and you're using their mouth and you're putting all that pressure on their mouth, which is fun. Kids love that. Oh, la, 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 la. Um, I, I love introducing warmer things and colder things to them. Again, we want them to learn how to use this, their mouths. So I like to use frozen grapes or popsicles or bananas. If as they get a little older, we want to include things that just are a little bit tougher because the, the jaw needs to get stronger in order for us to be able to speak. Um, I love crunchy things. So we need to teach our kids how to do crunchy. There's a sensory component to that. But there's as again, it's the other part is the learning to move their jaws. And I love our kids have a hype O a low ability to for, for different flavors. So they need stronger flavors. If you give one of our kids a big wedge of lime, for many of them, there'll be no affect. So we wanna give them that lime. We wanna give them those strong sours, those strong, a little bit longer heater stuff, heat. Um, I love these things called Warhead Sour Sprays. Um, you can get them virtually no calories, but they're so sour. And I use that as a positive thing. Oh, what a good day. And we'll spray it in their mouths. You, you did really well. Good job. And give them that sour. It wakes them up and it's a sensory awareness. It just kind of invigorates them and they love it. Um, sucking. 
is a really important thing. Sucking does two things. Besides the fact it increases our jaw muscles, when you suck something, you find that you can relax. So like chewing on things and sucking on things is an ability for a child to relax. And a normal child, when they're scared, a baby, when it's afraid or something, they're aroused, uh, an alert space, they, get, they cry. And as soon as they start to suck, you will see them start to relax. That is just a, an innate ability for children, infants to have. And our kids have never really learned that. So they oftentimes have a hard time regulating their behavior, their reaction to behavior because they haven't learned to suck and, and calm and soothe themselves. This is something we want to be able to teach them so that they can learn to calm themselves now as a baby. And then we can take some of those skills as they get older and teach them how to calm themselves as they get older. So we don't have a child that has tantrums and has some un desired behavioral issues. Those are things we can work on right now. So managing behavior, um, we're, we're actually not gonna go through this because I think the ages are kind of young, but um, I think that when, we, when we're looking at our children, if your child has a tantrum, this is the time to let them have the tantrum. Do not give in to them. So one of the things we started to do at this age is this is the age that you can teach a child that their actions have consequences, even at these very young ages. If, you know, not the zero to six months, but as, as they get a little older, we, we want them to learn that, you know, yes, if you do a positive thing, you're gonna get positive reinforcement. Um, we wanna make certain that when they have a little tantrum, they have a tantrum and you're not gonna give them whatever they want. Um, we, we, we always had to like go to a restaurant, bring two cars when they started to get around two, one and a half to two. If they started having a tantrum, you know, that was not behave, was not because of food, we would kind of address it. So we want to kind of start thinking about how we're going to address our children when they do have poor behavior at, at a very young age, because we want to encourage positive reinforcement. I love to reinforce positive. Good job. Good job. And, and really stay away from as much as you possibly can the negative. Um, I put, this, put these in here originally because I didn't know the ages. So I would say that this is something that we wanna deal with a little bit later. Um, conclusion, um, we know that all of our children are born with abnormal tone and they have sensory integration deficiencies. I want us to think about this oral motor, visual, tactile, vestibular, and proprioceptive systems. We want to take one thing on that sheet. Oral motor at this age, I really want to encourage the sucking, the different, different kind of flavors. Introduce lemon. You can put it inside their, their cheeks and get them to move their tongue lateral side to side. Visual, I want them to learn to bring things to their, to their face, to their mouth, and bring them back. That's how we learn distances. Tactile. This is the age I want you to really start working on massaging, going in deep um, and making certain that they have a desensitization to hypersensitivity on their skins. Um, this is also the age I want them to start wearing clothes that just a tad tighter so they can feel their, their arms and their legs and their trunk. Vestibular, you rock, you spin, you do whatever you possibly can. They are behind. They're behind a lot because it started in utero. So we want them to do a catch up. And then the proprioceptive system, you cannot do enough moving them around, putting them on their elbows, up to their arms. One of the things I'm going to tell you, I do not like to put our kids into standing until they're ready. If a child cannot move himself or herself from down on the ground to a seated position, the reason we see so much scoliosis is because we want to bring them upright too, too fast. Their, their spinal cord and the muscles around that spinal cord need to be stronger before they become fully upright. And that is just one of my little warnings that we always work on. I understand that we want our children to look like other children, but they're going to be delayed. We want them to follow the natural course of activities, but we want them to be strong in their trunk. With intervention, all of our children can have fulfilling and active. My kid is the greatest kid ever. He's Mr. Congeniality. He loves Special Olympics. He was on the swim teams. 
He's just the greatest, greatest kid ever. He's a delight. Right now, he works for me. I own a company. He is um, weaving. He weaves rugs and runners. Um, I, I love my son to death. He's a delightful, delightful person. We do have some behavioral issues, but we have minimized those. He loves to do things for the positive. There is a cure someday for a lot of these things, but right now there's not. So right now, these are the things, and these are the things that we'd have to address whether they had the hunger issues or not. So we need to address them as early and as quickly as possible. So conclusion, sensory diets are carried over from therapists to parents. Work with every one of your therapists. Talk to them about what you can do now as you're looking at your child, because these are the things we need to address now. Um, identifying that, get a recipe. Each child's gonna be different. Pick out these things. These are things that every one of the children needs, but your therapist can help you. Make sure you're at this age, you have a speech therapist who's working on oral motor and feeding. You have an OT who's really working on sensory. You have a PT that's working on core stabilization along with sensory. All three of your therapists should be working sensory as they're working on an area of the body. You need to make certain they're doing this. Make sure you're getting off therapies. What is therapy? Therapy is often two or three times a week. Try to get as much as you can and carry it over. And, and let's have fun. I mean, our kids are the greatest. Any questions? Thanks, Janice. That was so helpful. I feel like my daughter is um, 12 now. And I know you were one of the first moms that I met. And I feel like every time I hear you talk, I pick, I, I get more out of it. So I appreciate that you are always so willing to do this for us. Um, all the way from the zero to two age up through adults. I think that this is so applicable. Um, and it changes, um, which you know, with each child, you know, they grow and change. And um, with that, their strengths and weaknesses grow and change. And this is just, this is so helpful. I appreciate that you have taken the time to do this. Um, so we do have some questions. Let me go ahead and uh, I'm gonna read this one off the screen. It's, it's a little small, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, someone posted this anonymously. They said, is vision a vestibular issue with PWS and can it be corrected when children are older? My daughter is 11, but has been tested repeatedly for vision impairment with just a slight adjustment for nearsightedness. But she has always shown issues with functional vision. For example, doesn't notice what's in front of her and often trips over it in the same way someone with low vision issues who can't see things in their environment. Um, this is all well while wearing glasses and reading very well with glasses as far as, so she's seeing well far away, the glasses seem to be working, but yet functional vision. Okay, so is first, that a different, totally different age group. I, and I'm yeah. not seeing the child. So working back with these young parents, okay? Because I think this is a really important thing. So um, yes, we can increase visual acuity as we're working on not only vestibular, but as we're working on bringing things to our mouth and, and our children exploring. So many of our children, as I'm understanding it, have a lot of visual problems because at the very young age, that's how we start learning distances. When we're on our bellies and we grab for toys, we start bringing things to our mouth, we start realizing that this is, three, you know, this, is this far away, this far away, if it's that far away, I have to roll. And that's actually how we start to strengthen that. So we see many, many of our children that have some of those issues. On this particular child, I, I would have to talk to the mother and see the child because that's, yeah. that's a very complicated situation. But for my young mm -hmm. parents, going back to who my audience is right now, um, this is a really great opportunity for you to put your child on their belly, get, let them get upset, let them work on getting their back nice and straight and tight and, and stronger, but they can start bringing those toys to their body. They start learning to focus on stuff. Focus in a child begins close up and then they get farther and farther away as their world gets bigger. So we wanna keep that world very small in the beginning so that their vision is very clear. So. Again, I can't answer the mom, an 11 year old. I have an opinion on that, but I don't know the child. But I do will, will say that at this very young age, you have so many opportunities to resolve a lot of these 
issues that are happening to our older children if we get these kids on the floor and get them moving. I am sorry to the mom, but I have to see the child. She can, she can oh, eat at some point and we can talk later. The next question was, what do you mean by putting deep pressure on the joints? I love that question. Thank you so much. Um, so if we have a child, so when we're doing deep massage, okay, and then what you do is you can take your joint, I'm going to put my hand here, you just press, you can put, take your hand on either side of a joint and you just squeeze it together, right? So, or you, you know, you put a little pressure on their head um, so that they feel that joint, so that they feel that you're kind of pushing it together a little bit, not, not really, really hard, but, but you're pushing it together. You know, I love to do the shoulders, move their hands up and you just kind of push their shoulders. I did not bring a doll. Usually I love to do demos, but these virtual conferences, again, are a little wonky for me. Um, I have a video that I put out. It's a video for young babies. On that video, which I think you can find on YouTube, Ireland put it together. Please go on that video and look because I show you with a doll how to do this. Okay, and and I, it's an easy thing to learn, um, but it's just literally kind of pressing the joints together. Again, highly encourage you to look at that video. Yeah, there are actually a lot of videos, I believe, on YouTube. If you search Janice Agarwal's name, we also have some from previous conferences where we met in person. Um, Janice and Dr. Van Bossie often do sessions together. And I believe we have some of those on the FPWR YouTube page also. So you can check those out there. Um, the next question, is there such a thing as too much therapy? My three-year-old son has it all, both privately and at school with his IEP. It feels like it's all he does. Um, if it's good therapy, I'd say no. Um, I think what's happening right now, it used to be three times a week was the normal therapy per therapist. And, and up until about three or four, that was the normal. When I started in Boston, early intervention, that was therapy. So if you were thinking about getting in shape, if you walked, you know, if you went running one day a week or two days a week, you would, it would take you forever to get in shape. But if you do running three or four days a week, you start getting in shape. So if you've got good therapists that are communicating and you're seeing progress, no, I don't think that. And I say that now because the environment has changed so much when it comes to parents even being able to get therapies. So if you're getting those therapies and you can afford those therapies and you can handle it, I'd say yes, because many therapists and many families are not getting therapies. Yeah, I know around the age of three is when I focused more on what my daughter really needed most and took her to those therapies. And then there were things that we we might take two months off of one therapy and put her in swim lessons instead. Or, you know, like we would, we would try to play around and make it fun. But for the most part, therapy is you get you get out of it how much you put into it. So I, it, I will tell you the it, most positive powerful therapy you can get your child in is hippotherapy on a horse. Mm -hmm. And the reason hippotherapy is so powerful is it kind of inculcates everything. So you're working on vestibular balance because they're staying on the horse. You've got all the sensory tactile going on. They become, it's a nesting syndrome, but you start to see their alignment happen, their head gets stronger, their body trunk gets stronger and they start talking. Like it's the most amazing thing you start to you start to see everything come together because that is the most powerful tool any therapist has in their their whole bag of tricks. So if you want to do an all in one kind of session, get yourself and your kid into hippotherapy very quickly because that is one of the most powerful and I believe in most states we have fought for a lot of people to get this. Um, as soon as your child can sit independently, they can get from down up to sitting, you can put your child in hippotherapy. And if hippotherapy isn't available, do you think um, horseback riding, just general horseback riding therapy? I know here we don't have hippotherapists, but we have a therapy uh, stable where they will take children with volunteers and people who are making sure it's a safe environment but there isn't a trained hippotherapist there. Do you think that's still beneficial? Um, 
okay, so the professional part of me says, I can't say anything. The mom side of me says, um, you know, they're such powerful tools. Maybe bring your therapist mm -hmm. out to see what they're doing and come up with a set of goals to work on. It's such a powerful tool, you know, and our kids, I, our kids have empathy and that's a tough word to mm -hmm. say. They feel, they interact, they, they are magnetized towards these animals and they'll do anything to get on these horses. And these horses are so magnificent. And the kids, they, like I have seen kids go from not doing very much to weeks later, just seeing amazing progress. So, you know, as a mom, I would say, get it any way you can. As a therapist, you need to go to hippotherapy. You take that yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, I think it's also helpful with the building the muscles on each side of the spine. So when it comes to scoliosis, it's a great- uh, So my son, um, Alex, um, who you see all the pictures, he's cute. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he was very hypotonic. So when it comes to normal children, there, there are different levels of hypotonicity. He was a, a, the lowest level. I mean, he didn't have head control till he was one. We always were keeping his scoliosis at bay. If he got sick, it would go to 34 degrees. But as long as we kept him on a horse, we could keep it between seven and 13 degrees. That because of the bilateral attitude of horses, you know, when a horse walks, it emulates the pelvic moving of walking, but they have to keep it nice and straight, their spine nice and straight. So there's like almost no way to make it so there's not balance there. Again, it's kind of one of those great, great tools that a kid can have. And so that's how we kept his scoliosis at bay for a kid who was very, very low, low tone. Yeah, we have a very similar story with that. Okay, so the next question. My son is 30 months. He walks but loses his balance and runs into things. How do I help him? He's been walking for eight months. Okay, awesome. Hey, great that he's walking. Again, vestibular, vestibular, vestibular. You know, this is the age you start really doing the spinning um, because if he's running into seams, one of the things I, the first things you saw come up is when you have vestibular problems and some proprioceptive, you are very clumsy. And that's part of that. So it's an awareness of their whole, their uh, body awareness and their, their um, environment awareness. So I would really work on spinning, you know, put them in an office chair and spin them around, stop at once to make sure they don't have their doll's eyes, which means the eyes go from left to right. You'll, you'll note it when you see it. It's a kind of, a, you, you'll know what I'm talking about when you see it. But, um, and then just keep spinning them, make sure they're safe, but do that spinning. You cannot get enough of that. Sit and spins. Again, take off the center and let them spin around. You will see a huge change as soon as you do that. This is also an age you can put them on those little trampolines. So they have trampolines naturally give you body awareness. We were talking about the joint receptors. Well, when you're bouncing up and down on a trampoline, your joints know you're bouncing up and down. It works on proprioception and vestibular at the same time. Those little trampolines, they can hold on to things. Those are fun things to do. Tire swings. I love tire swings when they're really young. Put a piece of board inside the tire so they don't fall through. But once you start, they're going to want to keep going again and again. That was one of the first investments we had were swings and tire swings. So you cannot, I mean, everyone should have a tire spinning swing. Everybody should have swings for their kids. Can't recommend them enough. All right. The next question, I might be saying this wrong. So it says, is it okay to use Oteru? which is an immersion therapy for babies. It's O-T-E-R-O-O, -O -O. Otero. I, I don't immersion. know the therapy, I'd have to look it up. That's something for a mom to talk to me privately about. Um, okay. What I've given you, so I was trained in England with a family called the Bobaths. And every group has, every person has their own little system. And that you can only do it this way. I don't believe in that at all. I believe you have a big bag of tricks and you use the ones you need at the time you need them. So I might use a little bit of NDT here. I might use a little bit of Fineswell here, whatever, right? And I, I'm a person that believes that our children are not defined by one thing. 
They're defined by having a whole kit that you can use a lot of different things so that they can become more acclimated to our environment. That's my personal opinion. I don't believe there's any one group that does everything all at once. Again, our kids are just too complex for that. Yeah. Okay, the last question is, uh, my PT and OT says that my son is doing well. He doesn't need therapy every week. I ask them to see more, but they always say he is doing well and they see him once a month. Is it something I should be worried oh my about? How old, is, how old is this baby? It doesn't oh. say, um, I'm assuming younger just based on yeah. the age, but they didn't specify. So, um, wow. No, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. And, and what's happening is, is we're because of costs, our kids are getting less and less therapies, fewer and fewer therapies. No, that child should be getting therapies pretty much once or twice a week, a week. So if the therapists don't understand the syndrome, and this is one syndrome out of thousands and thousands of syndromes, they can have my email, they can call me, we can talk. We can come up with a really fun plan for you to work with that person, A. Or B, they can start reviewing and learning and researching, or you may need new therapist because yeah. this is a very complex syndrome. This is not something that just gets better and goes away. Your child just doesn't reach all their milestones and voila, it's over. This is something that is a lifelong thing. They're, we're constantly going to have to increase the challenges to them. This is not something that someone can just write off and say they're fine. You will regret that because then when, a, when the next milestone hits and they don't hit it, we've got to bring people in and we've got to backtrack. We don't want to backtrack. We want to get them as close to normal as possible. I cannot begin to tell you how important it is to fight at these ages to get what you need. And once a month is not therapy. I don't even know what once a month is. That's a consult. No. There's no way yeah. that can even happen. That is just unacceptable. Yep. All right. That is all the questions that we have for today. Um, Janice, thank you so much. I appreciate that you took the time today to speak with us. Um, Janice has mentioned, you know, she has videos, she has books, she has a just plethora of resources available. Um, and you are also a PWS mom and easy to reach out to and speak to. Um, so we appreciate so much that you have taken the time today with us. Um, 